on an all-new Dr. Phil. They claim their mom is addicted. I was a nurse for almost 50 years. I think I know what I'm doing when it comes to medication. She's had a fentanyl patch on her for 12 years now. 12 years. Does anybody ever tell her straight up, you're an addict? Are you addicted to pain medication? No, I'm dependent on it. Dependence isn't the same as addiction. If the doctor doesn't give you the drugs you want, you just tell them you're going to kill yourself. You had a driver's test just recently and passed. Did they know that you had had four accidents in five months? No, I had three accidents. Would you actually put innocent children in a 3,500-pound missile with you at the wheel? Yes. Let's do it. Good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. Get ready to take care of you. and Jean are here today to give their mother Blanche an ultimatum. Choose drugs or the family. Now they claim her addiction, as they call it, started in the 90s after a car accident and she has been spiraling ever since. Now Blanche's daughter claims she now drives high. Gets behind the wheel high and has gotten into four accidents in five months and once even ran over herself. Now, Blanche is a retired nurse, and they say she could easily manipulate doctors into giving her an endless supply of opioids. Now, the sisters say they're just out of ideas. They say they are desperate for help. My mother, Blanche, has been addicted to drugs for almost 30 years. In the mid-90s, Blanche had a car accident where her foot was crushed, and that's how she became addicted initially to Vicodin. She has a fentanyl patch, and she takes Oxycontin on top of that. She puts on a new patch every 48 hours. When she thinks she can't have those drugs or if she misplaces them, she gets frantic. I just don't know how you could feel pain at all if you're on a never-ending supply of fentanyl and Oxycontin. My mom has had at least four or five car accidents in the last five months. She T-boned somebody a couple weeks later, did the exact same thing, and ran over herself with the rental car. She fell asleep exiting a freeway. She was sideswiped by somebody coming out of a driveway. If she's on fentanyl and Oxycontin 24 hours a day, it's not safe for her to be driving. We're worried someone's going to get killed. Nobody has to worry about me driving because I took a driving test yesterday and I passed. I'm safe to drive. My mom was a nurse for many years. To see a nurse be so reckless with her own health is absolutely the worst. My mom is in absolute denial that she has a problem with these drugs. I really am hoping that Dr. Phil can help my mother with her drug addiction. I'm not addicted to fentanyl. I am dependent upon it, which is different than addiction. With all this concern for their mother's well-being, you would imagine Erica and Jean had a wonderful childhood with warm memories of their mother. Sadly, it was just the opposite. As a young child, I can't ever remember my mother hugging us and kissing us. She doesn't deserve the title of mom, so that's why I call her Blanche. We never had any nurturing. We were never once told that we were loved. I remember doing the dishes at four years old. We were ironing, vacuuming, mopping the floors, cleaning the bathrooms. When I was in the third grade, I made a flower pot. I brought it home to my mother, and she turned around and smashed it on the floor because I hadn't made my bed. I do remember the flower pot incident. I just kind of stayed out of the way. I did not want to get in trouble because we lived in fear. That's how insane she was about the chores. She was physically abusive as well as emotionally abusive. One of my, the worst memories of my mother was her on top of me strangling me. I did choke her. I wanted her to quit crying and she wouldn't. It was really hard to watch the violence. If you would have tried to do anything, you'd have been in the same situation as me. Yes. 
I absolutely would have gotten my ass beat if I tried to step in. My kids had a good life. They learned to ski. We went on a lot of camping trips. She took us skiing. She used to take us camping. That was all good. But most of my memories are negative. Blanche taught me everything not to do. It's good to meet you. It's great to meet you. Grateful to be here, sir. What are your first memories of your mother being on drugs? The car accident. Even if she had taken um, prescription pain medication prior to that, we didn't know about it. But more importantly, we didn't observe the behavior prior to that car accident. You can tell when someone's high. So the accident was really an accident. It wasn't her... Correct. In 1995, she generally had an accident where her foot was crushed. Okay. That's mm -hmm. when things really started to spiral. So we're talking 20 plus years here. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. And you've talked to her straight up about her drugs. How often? We pretty much when we're with her because she asks to do things that she's not capable of doing because mm -hmm. of the drugs. She asked me, do you think I'm ever going to be able to babysit my grandkids? And I said, no. So then she asked my daughter, and my daughter was like, no, because you're, you're frequently too heavily medicated. So. Did, does anybody ever tell her straight up, not you're too heavily medicated, but yeah. you're an addict, you're high. I'm not turning over my grandkids to a drug addict. I tell her you are absolutely over-medicated. She's had a fentanyl patch on her for 12 years now. 12 years. Telling somebody who's been wearing a fentanyl patch for 12 years that they're over-medicated is like telling evil Knievel he's driving a little aggressively. Zine has always been more tactful. <laughs> I have told her to her face, you're a drug addict, get off the dope. I came to a point where I finally said, it's the dope or me. No reply. So I finally sent her a text message that said, I knew you, I knew you would pick the dope over your children. Jean, you say she was never um, mother of the year. No, no. We've seen pictures of like, camping and horseback riding okay. and stuff. You said that's because she wanted to go camping and horseback riding and had nowhere else to put you guys, so she took you. She wanted to go horse camping. She got me into that, and it's a great thing. But soon as her health got so bad, she just gave everything up. She just started circling the drain. Erica, you said that she never misses dinner? She loves to eat out. But what about her pain? And all when it comes to that's our question is we've never witnessed any actual pain to prevent her from doing something fun and i could call her up and say yep for a movie she's not in too much pain for that mm -hmm. but when it comes to adulting and taking care of herself around her own house it's she's in too much pain mm -hmm. and I, I heard her comment about choking you and she didn't deny it no. She said, well, yeah, she wouldn't stop crying. She didn't deny choking me, but she did deny knowing that I was removed from the home um, after people at my school found out. And so I didn't really get any resolution, and I just, I knew I shouldn't have confronted her because there was never going to be an apology for choking me. And there wasn't, and there hasn't been. Well, coming up, Erica and Jean's mother, Blanche, says um, she's not addicted. She says she's dependent on drugs and that that's different. Is she in denial? Well, we're going to meet Blanche and talk about that next. I was a nurse for almost 50 years. I think I know what I'm doing when it comes to medication. My children should be happy that I'm not in pain, but my children have never, ever asked me, how's your pain level? If it weren't for medication, I would be in excruciating pain all day. And later, would you actually take your grandchildren for a ride? Well, the DMV just proves that I can drive very well. That wasn't the question. The question was, would you, in good conscience, 
put your grandchildren in a car, load them up, and take off down the road. Monday. Their relationship is toxic. I have a hard time looking at him without feeling hate. You were threatening to beat her with a belt, and then you said... I'm gonna be God. That was said in anger. You tried to stuff a bleach-soaked rag down her throat? I did, in a, in a fit of rage. I shoved it in her mouth. I fear if I leave him, he gets visitation with my kids alone. This family is on fire. We need to put out the fire. That's Monday. Then on Tuesday, a violent husband. He is capable of killing me. Take me through the moment that you chase your pregnant wife through the yard and grab her and slam her down. I just, it happens. That's Tuesday. Not only is my mom killing herself with these drugs, but she also has an addictive personality. She's a food addict. She's a shopping addict. She doesn't have one cat. She has seven cats and two dogs. Oh, come over here. When she smoked, she smoked four packs a day. Then it was eating. Then she got gastric bypass. She still struggles with a food addiction. My mom's not going to go anywhere without her snacks, whether it's M&M's or crackers. I do like M&M's. If you open her cupboard, she has about 16 boxes of the same type of cracker. Probably about 8 or 10 boxes, because sometimes I like a snack. I haven't been to the house because it's just too hard to see Blanche living in those conditions. Erica and Jean are desperate for help with their elderly mother, who they claim is addicted to fentanyl, oxycodone, shopping food, uh, even her pets. But Blanche says she's never been high and is tired of no one listening to her. My family thinks I'm addicted to drugs. And you do not get high from drugs when you are in pain. I have pain in my foot because I was in a car accident and my foot was shattered. But I've been taking pain medication long before I had a car accident because of my headaches. I was a nurse for almost 50 years. I think I know what I'm doing when it comes to medication. Oh, I have 13 bottles of medicine that I take on a daily basis. I take Topamax, Diltazium, Eliquis, Bupropion, Mirbetric, Citalopram. This is Xanax, but I never take it. I have three medications for depression. I have a medication for my heart, and I take something for overactive bladder. They tried Botox on me. They put a nerve stimulator in my head, and it helped about one-third. I wear a fentanyl patch because I'm in pain all the time. If it weren't for medication, I would be in excruciating pain all day. What bothers my daughter is the fentanyl and the Percocet. My children should be happy that I'm not in pain, but my children have never, ever asked me, how's your pain level? I'm going to trust the doctor's medical degrees over my daughter's opinions. Well, Blanche, how are you feeling today? Fine. What, what do you think we're here to talk about? Well, I came because my daughters wanted me to, and I would like to be closer to them, obviously. Uh-huh. Is that obvious? Do you make it obvious to them that you want to be closer to them? Yes, I try to. Uh-huh. Are you addicted to pain medication? No, I'm dependent on it. A dependence uh -huh. isn't the same as addiction. Uh-huh. And what's the difference in your mind? Dependence is when you need it and you're dependent upon it. And addiction is when you use it to get high. I've never been high. You've been on these pain medications, you said, since before your car accident, you were on for your headaches? Yes, I still have them. I mean, they never it never goes away. Uh-huh. And what's the nature of your headaches? They don't know. So how long have you been on pain medication? 25 years, 30 years? Oh, my whole life. You had a driver's test just recently and passed. Thursday. Thursday? Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave you a license? Oh, yeah. Did they know that you had had four accidents in five months? No, I had three accidents, and one wasn't my fault. What about the T-bone accident in the intersection? You T-boned somebody. I hit his car. I hit his uh, tire. He didn't have any um, okay. uh, damage to his car. Okay. But that's one. 
And, and, and then, then there was the other one when the guy came out right in front of me. And then there was the one where I tried to put the car in park and I got dragged down the driveway. And falling asleep at the wheel. That was cues. 20 years ago. But mom, you've been on the pills these long. I was tired because I'd been up since four in the morning. Well, they're concerned about you is the point. And if you, if you were a nurse for 48 years, then you know that being on pain medication for a long time has a lot of side effects, right? Correct. And all of the side effects start to create a, a brain fog and slow your reaction times and creating a, a, a problem that you eventually can't keep up with. Now, if you're in the medical field and you're a nurse, I'm telling you things that you know to be science. I also know what pain does to people. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute, but let's not deflect from what I'm talking about right now. Has your doctor talked to you about this? Yes, we talk every month. And have you threatened him if he doesn't give it to you that you'll kill yourself? No. Excuse me? What? You have advised me on multiple occasions that if the doctor doesn't give you the drugs you want, you just tell him you're going to kill yourself. And you were proud of it, that that's how you get what you want. You said it to my face more than once. So yeah. why well, would that's you... what pain does to you. Okay, okay. But we can't deny the fact But I've never told my used... doctor you... that. Okay. Okay, we'll have to agree to disagree. But I know I heard that. Well, up next, Blanche's family claims that she was so high at her grandson's wedding that she passed out in her plate of food at the reception. She says, not, not true, not because I've never been anything. high. Uh, we'll hear from her granddaughter next. My grandmother has asked me if she can babysit the kids or take them somewhere, but I will not allow her to watch the kids. She's always on pain medication, and I don't trust her behind the wheel of a car watching my children. Dr. Phil May. Welcome to the... My son got married in October, and Blanche was literally so high. She came to my nephew's wedding, and we just kept watching, going, oh, please don't fall. As we were doing the toes, she zoned out and fell asleep over her plate. She was unable to stand up by herself and needed to be supported. My son had to hold her up for wedding photos. It was terribly embarrassing. I was not under the influence at my grandson's wedding. I had a hard time walking on grass. Well, Erica and Jean claim Blanche is in complete denial that she is addicted to her prescription drugs. Blanche claims she's never been high in her life, but the family says they've witnessed it, and her granddaughter Corinne says that there's no way that she would trust Blanche with her children. My grandmother has been addicted to painkillers for a very long time. I don't understand how she can be in that much pain when she's on such heavy-duty drugs. I know that she sees more than one doctor. I would not put it past her to doctor shop. I'm looking at a picture of my grandmother that's less than four years old, and you can tell her how much healthier she was. She's sitting upright. She's smiling. Now she's slumped over. My daughter mentioned that her leg was hurting. My grandmother was suggesting that we give her medication. I had to tell my grandmother that she could not discuss medications with my daughter any longer. My grandmother has asked me if she can babysit the kids or take them somewhere, but I will not allow her to watch the kids. She's always on pain medication, and I don't trust her behind the wheel of a car watching my children. I need her to be alert. I can't go to her house because I'm allergic to cats. She doesn't dust and keep things clean. She will rope people into carrying her cat litter into the house. She's going to put somebody to work. I bought two 42-pound cases of litter that I need brought over here next to the dog food. I try to put in as much effort as I can to keep in touch with her. I don't get that kind of effort back from her. Well, Corinne, welcome. Hi, thank you. Blanche is saying she's never been high and that she wasn't under the influence at the wedding. Was she impaired at the wedding? I would say she was. 
I was very tired because I wake up at 4 and 5 in the morning and can't get back to sleep. You're having trouble sleeping? And, you know, that's a side effect of prolonged use of pain meds. But she takes sleeping, sleeping pills. pills. No, I don't. Yes, you do. No, I don't. I haven't taken them for at least two years. You're a nurse. Come on. Let's not pretend that you don't know this, because you do. If you've been on pain medications for 30 years, that's a long time to be on pain medication. And if you're still hurting after 30 years, you need to think about getting some new doctors to treat whatever's hurting, right? It's not like I don't try to find something. Uh-huh. You don't want to get off the pain medication, though. I don't want to be in pain. Well, I don't want you to be in pain. If you've got some alternative that would help me, I would certainly try it. You have to be a willing spirit to um, figure out what's going on with you. You've got a lot of years of life that you could be sharing with your family and your grandchildren that you can't do if you live your life in a drug haze. And look, it's it's up to you. It's not up to me, but you're not going to let her take charge of of her grandchildren, right? That's correct. There, I mean, there's no way you're going to do Would you actually take your grandchildren for a ride? Well, the DMV just proved that I can drive very well. That wasn't the question. The question was, would you, in good conscience, put your grandchildren in a car, load them up, and take off down the road? Yes. You would put innocent children in a 3,500-pound missile with you at the wheel and take off down the road? Yes. Up next, Erica and Jean claim that Blanche had several surgeries that are really just for attention and more drugs. We'll talk about that next. <laughs> says that you strangled her and left bruises on her throat. At yes, and time. I'm not proud of that. I've apologized and apologized and apologized. Excuse me, has never apologized one single time. And in fact, when confronted directly about it, just lied to get out of it. Have never apologized to me, and you know you never have. Abby Silverman, the fabulous digital creative director at Cosmo... I do believe all of Blanche's pain is over-exaggerated. She goes on cruises. She goes to a lot of live performances. She goes out to dinner. She has a lot of fun in her life. I go out to lunch twice a month, which I don't think is too extravagant. She has a hard time doing day-to-day -day basic things because of her pain. However, she just got back from a two-week cruise. I went on a cruise to the Caribbean, and it wasn't anything special. Erica Jean and Corinne say Blanche is always complaining how she is in pain and can't move, but will never miss doing anything fun with her friends. Now, Blanche says she's the outcast of the family, and they just don't invite her anymore. Why don't you invite her? It's painful to watch her in her decline and her continued denials. What She's... about all the 30 years before then? What about it? You've never invited me to dinner. You might be right. I maybe didn't invite you to dinner. But there's a reason for that. Because of the behavior that comes with it. I'm sorry, but when you attend family functions, you tend to sit in a chair and play on your phone and fall asleep in the chair. And that was way before the fentanyl. I don't know why you're trying to convince me you don't have a problem. Because you do have a problem, and you're not going to convince me otherwise. Well, now, we're going to open that can. We're going to eat the whole thing. <laughs> and that, that goes way back. Uh, because this relationship started when they were children, and you admitted yourself that you weren't exactly a warm and fuzzy mom. No, I did the best I could, but no, I wasn't. Do you recall in the third grade, Erica, making you a 
flower pot and proudly presenting it to you when she came home and you turn around smashing it on the floor? No, I don't. But if she says I did, I must have. She says that you strangled her and left bruises on her, on her throat. At yes, and time. I'm not proud of that. I've apologized and apologized and apologized. Excuse me, has never apologized one single time. And in fact, when confronted directly about it, just lied to get out of it. Have never apologized to me, and you know you never have. I did apologize you did to not. you at that time. Well, we have time now. Okay, I, to I totally apologize to you. I'm very, very sorry. What about it are you sorry about? About the whole thing. I was extremely frustrated and lost my temper. Tell her, not me. I did tell her before that I was extremely frustrated and lost my temper. She can't deny that. I can deny it because this is the first time I'm hearing you say you were frustrated. I've never known why you did that to me that day. Can I give you some coaching here since, I mean, I, mean, I am Dr. Phil. <laughs> I mean, this, is, this is what I do. <laughs> you know when she's going to hear an apology? It's when she hears from you that you know how that made her feel. feel. That's when she knows you really are sorry about it. I am sorry about it, and I do know how it made you feel. How? How, how, did, it, how do you think it made me feel? Terrible. How did it make that 13-year-old girl feel? Terrible, and that's why I took her to counseling. Because I was the problem. I needed the counseling. You always made it sound like I was just a bad kid, so... No, your father made you feel that way. I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. You always made it sound like it was him, but you were right in there with him, and that's huge to me. You tell people in our family what a monster he was and what a brute he was, but you don't tell anybody in the family that you were a monster, too. You don't tell anybody about your part. You're too busy telling them what a horrible child I am because I don't I've wait. I've never told anybody that you're a horrible child, mother. Jean, you said there was a lot of domestic violence and it wound up just being channeled towards your sister. Yes. I was um, a witness to all of it, but there was nothing I could do to stop it. I knew that if I didn't walk a very straight and narrow path, that I wouldn't be spared either. So I, I really did learn from her beatings. Blanche says that uh, she wants a better relationship with her family, but Jean, Erica, and Corinne say it's just not gonna happen if she's not willing to change her ways. We'll talk about that next. <laughs> If you could be pain-free and medication-free, that would be what you would want, right? Yes. What about marijuana? She doesn't want to speak to me. In fact, at Christmas time, she said, Christmas is going to be at my house, so you need to make other arrangements. The reason my mother was disinvited to Christmas and basically now all family function is because I told her she had to choose me or the drugs and I didn't even get the courtesy of a reply. She's just going to sit there in a stupor, over medicated, and it's hard on the family to watch that. It made me feel bad, but I wasn't surprised about it. Christmas without Blanche this year was great. We had a real good time. Blanche? You know, I, I kind of have mixed emotions about what to say to you. Um, I've often said the hardest thing to do is talk to a drunk about their drinking while they're drunk. And, you know, talking to you, you are in an altered state of consciousness. It's not healthy for you. And you're you're not in good health are you doing physical therapy are you doing any support therapies for these pains that you're having yes i go to physical therapy really how often do you go i was going three times a week i said how often are you going i'm not going right now because they discharged me but i was going three times a week and when was that up until a month ago. 
starting in. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to continue with the exercises at home. I remember you saying the tape piece, you spent 10 hours a day in that recliner. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. You know, if, Blanche, if you want to get healthy, you got to make a commitment that I'm not sure you're prepared to make. I'm not prepared to be in pain. That wasn't the question. Okay. I said if you want to get healthy, which would be pain-free, you, you got to be willing to make a commitment, and that is to take charge of your health with some new, fresh doctors that yes. take an approach to this that is completely objective. You said to me in kind of a passing moment, you said, well, if you've got some alternatives, I'm willing to consider them. Um, I, I, I do have some alternatives if, if you're willing to explore them, but my alternatives do not even almost include you remaining on pain medications for another year, two years, three years. It involves you getting to something that makes medical scientific sense. If you could be pain-free and medication-free, that would be what you would want, right? Yes. If you're interested in exploring these things, then you let me know, and I'll make those arrangements for you, and we'll explore this. Okay. Start making the arrangements. Okay, because I don't want to yank you off these medications and leave you in pain. That, that's no solution. What about marijuana? <laughs> it has applications. But I will leave that to the physicians to discuss. Okay? All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to be talking to these three because uh, I've said what I have to say to Blanche. We'll be right back. If you have advanced enough. Well, I'm back with Erica, Jean, and Corinne. I have um, excused Blanche. What I want to talk to the three of you about is kind of a reality check. The prognosis of her making a major change in her life at this point is not great. She's been on these drugs for 30 years, mm -hmm. and she's 76, mm -hmm. and she's infirm. And I, I'm not sure that that's what she wants to do at this point in her life. Because, in her view, what she's doing is working for her. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we can't make the effort, but, you know, I can explain it to her, but I can't understand it for her. And I can arrange it for her, but I can't go to the appointments right. for her. Right. Which means you guys have to adjust your expectations and realize that there's a distinct possibility that you may have to accept the fact that she can't give you what she doesn't have. I said, if she hasn't apologized, then it's a good time to do it. And she doesn't know how. What she needed to say, if she truly got it, if she was present, she would have said, you're 13 years old. And I'm the person in the world that's there to protect you, and here I am attacking you and choking you. You must have been terrified. I am so sorry. I can't imagine how you must have felt when I'm, I'm supposed to be your soft place to fall. Can you ever forgive me for that? I'm so sorry. I'll spend the rest of my life trying to make you feel safe. She doesn't have those words. She doesn't have the concept of that. No. That could have just changed everything if I could just get one heartfelt apology. She doesn't Real. have the mom gene. She's devoid of the mom gene. But you know what? She can't, she can't give you what she doesn't have. And if you spend the rest of your life waiting for that, you'll be disappointed if you accept the fact that she can't give it to you because she doesn't have it then you have to give it to each other mm -hmm. stop the generational legacy right here right now yeah. 
Give it to her. Give it to her. Give it to her. You three say, this stops now. Yeah. This won't happen with your children. No, it won't. No. The best way to, to fill an empty void in you is, is to give away what you need the most. Make sure you do that. But understand, you came through this and you're still here. And be proud of that. Thank I you, mean, Dr. seriously, be proud of that. Look at what you've overcome and be proud of that. Thank and you. you should be proud of that, I'm telling you. <laughs> Thank you. you. You did the right thing in coming here and know that you've done what you can do. And give yourself that credit. I've done what I can do. I've done what I can do. And now it's up to her. Thank you, Dr. Phil. All right. Coming up, two sisters who lost over 100 pounds together with a surprising and fun strategy. They'll tell us about it next. Coming up on Dr. Phil, visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter. You'll get weekly updates, live strategies, and exclusive video that you won't find anywhere else. Plus, on DrPhil.com, you can see sneak previews of upcoming shows. Log on today. For so many people, losing weight can be a difficult and challenging journey. For some people, it works best by having a friend or relative share that journey. For others, it's taking it one step at a time on their own. Now, with me today are two sisters, Bethany and Carissa, who found a unique and fun way to lose weight that they say really worked great for them. So thank you both for being here. Thank you. Now, Bethany, tell me a little bit more about this journey. Well, hi, Dr. Phil. Uh, my sister Carissa and I decided that we wanted to get healthier. We wanted to improve our lifestyle together. And at the time, we were actually living in the same household with our husbands. And we have six kids combined. Oh, wow. All girls, <laughs> ages 5 up to 15. And with such a big support system, I was actually able to lose 40 pounds. Oh, wow. So, Carissa, how has this experience been for you? Two it's, families, six kids? It was a lot. I'm not going to lie. It has been absolutely amazing. We didn't fight the entire time. Really? We made our meals together, everything. We ate healthier together. And because of that, I've lost 68 pounds. Oh, wow. And together, wow. we have lost over 100. Wow. Well, congratulations. So, Carissa, what was the unique solution that you and your sister found to lose this weight? Everybody wants to know. Whenever we felt like snacking, we would grab our phones and play the app game Solitaire Grand Harvest instead. That really worked for us. So, did playing the game help you in other ways in addition to losing weight? It definitely decreases your stress. And having so many people in one household, it's hard to find time for yourself and that's where the game comes in handy, and we play together every day now. Yeah. I enjoy it because it's a little challenging. You get to, it's got different levels and different fun stuff to try out, so it keeps you on your toes. Yeah. Well, I play on three different devices, mine, my husband's, and a spare phone we keep in the drawer. Oh, my God. <laughs> Not all at the same time. Sometimes. Oh, really? Well, it's, a, it's great to hear that you found a way to improve your health in, in such a fun way. The game is the perfect daily dose of personal growth. And even if it's simply taking a much-needed break from your day, and since you both play every day, how about a little friendly competition right now? Yes. Let's see how you do. You have your phones, so we're going to see who can finish their solitaire first. Get ready, set, all right, play. Solitaire Grand Harvest completely reinvented the nostalgic fun of solitaire. The game is easy to play, but also requires players to be strategic, making it a great way to sharpen your brain. You play on a beautiful open farm, and the goal is to harvest your crops so you can move up levels and receive rewards. It's the perfect balance of challenging yet relaxing fun. With busy schedules and constant demands, it can be difficult to schedule time. You did it already. That's great. It's so important to set aside moments in your day to invest in yourself like Bethany and Carissa have. Great job. And since both of you ladies are such great sports, Solitaire Grand Harvest is giving you each an e-gift card of $100 to spend on anything that you like. Oh, that's um, awesome. 
So this is a game that you just must try. So go to the App Store or Google Play on your device to download Solitaire Grand Harvest for free. Uh, and when you do, you'll get a special welcome bonus of 20,000 coins, and you can see all the colors and everything. It's just a lot of fun, so I, I highly recommend it. I'd like to thank all of my guests today. Thanks to Bethany and Carissa for sharing your journey. If you'd like to join us here in the studio audience, go to my website, drphil.com, for details. We really have a good time here, right?